underwater salvage. Divers recover ghost nets from the depths of the sea. These old fishing nets become deadly traps for millions of marine animals. They become plastic waste that can poison oceans for centuries. And they cause agonizing deaths above the surface, too. What's the solution to this dangerous problem? How can we stem the global tide of ghost nets? The ship Goa leaves Glova Harbor on the island of Rügen. On this summer's day, the small salvage vessel is on a special mission in the Baltic Sea. It's being escorted by a boat full of divers aiming to recover ghost nets. Ghost nets are abandoned fishing gear. Even though they're not being used anymore, they're still very efficient at killing, which of course makes no sense because there's no purpose for it. If a dolphin or a porpoise gets snagged in one, it drowns because it can't reach the surface. Verena Platt works for GRD, a German dolphin rescue organization. The environmental NGO regularly conducts ghost net recovery missions in the Baltic Sea. Verena Platt organized today's effort. I first had a scuba tank on my back at age five. Over the years, I've seen how the marine world has changed. There's a decline in species. I used to see seahorses, sea bream, all kinds of animals. Today, it's getting harder and harder. Ghost nets are among the causes of this decline. In the Baltic Sea alone, up to 10,000 nets or parts of nets come ashore every year. Often, they've been lost in storms or accidents or snagged on wrecks or other obstacles. Each year, up to 1 million tons of new ghost nets are estimated to go into the world's oceans. As a result, more than 130,000 whales, dolphins, seals, and sea lions, as well as millions of fish, turtles, and birds die every year. Around the world, about 800 species are affected. Add to that the countless smaller organisms that are vital for marine ecosystems. The GRD works with experienced divers who know the local area. They take part at their own risk. We're at 45 meters, nearly there. Today's operation is led by Wolfgang Frank. He's a professional diver who's been running a diving business on Rügen for 25 years. The boy's in place. So you can start getting ready. We've clarified the target below the red buoy. There's a big pile there, the torn part of a trawling net. On his many dives, Wolfgang Frank always keeps an eye out for ghost nets. A few months ago at this spot, I found bits of net where things like cod can get caught. There's a long steel cable, and the net is caught on that. We want to bring it up. They locate the steel cable at a depth of around 10 meters. The net is wrapped tightly around it. It will be difficult to get it free. Another problem is the poor visibility. The visibility here in the Baltic makes things very, very difficult. There are a lot of algae residues in the water, algal blooms caused by the warming of the Baltic Sea. When we dive for a net, the visibility is still okay, like three or four meters, so we can orient ourselves. 
But as soon as we touch the net, we really have zero visibility. Then you more or less have to feel your way around. The net is cut into pieces, partly to reduce the risk of a diver getting entangled. At the next site, caution is once again needed. There's part of a trawler net there. On top is an old trap anchor or an old metal frame. We're going to try to lift the frame first and then get the bit of trawler net or whatever else is down there. The net is very difficult to separate from the anchor. It's a back-breaking job. You never know what's going to be down there, especially when it comes to trawler nets, which naturally work their way into the seabed. When we put our buoyancy bag there, we can only see a little bit of the upper part. We can't see everything that's there in the seabed. The anchor is extremely heavy. The divers have to install several buoyancy bags and fill them with air. Visibility is terrible, and it's still not clear whether the recovery will be a success. Ghost nets aren't only a problem in the sea itself. Their remnants also end up on the world's coasts including the beaches of the North Sea, like here near the popular resort town of St. Peter-Ording. This is a typical bit of net from the local fishery. We find these everywhere along the coasts and wherever there's intensive fishing, like around the British Isles or here in the Wadden Sea. These ghost nets wreak havoc for decades or even centuries because they're so strong. They're made of plastic. This one's probably polyamide, very robust. It can take from 200 to 600 years to decompose. Kim Detloff regularly walks along various North Sea beaches to monitor them on behalf of the Nature and Biodiversity Conservation Union. He finds plenty of trash in the process. On these beaches, we find about 150 pieces of trash per 100 meters of coastline. 30 to 50 percent of that is from the fishing or shipping industries. Ghost nets don't only pollute beaches and kill marine life. They're also plastic waste. And over time, they break down into microplastics. That means they travel through the food chain and end up on the plates of us humans. Each time Kim Detloff goes to the beach, he also finds lots of smaller pieces of brightly colored netting. This is very common. It's called a dolly rope. It's used during bottom trawling to protect the net, which is more valuable, more expensive. Bottom trawling for flatfish or crabs involves dragging the net over the seafloor, over stones and beds of mussels. So there's abrasion and wear. That's why they put this dolly rope underneath. It amounts to a deliberate littering of the oceans, pure and simple. Each year, an average of around 25 tons of dolly rope end up on European beaches. The dolly rope problem is quite well known in the fishing industry. About 70 percent of German fishing boats no longer use them. But it's still widely used in the Dutch fishery. That goes to show how the problem knows no national borders. This is garbage that may well have been lost by a Dutch boat. So we need a Europe-wide solution. Brussels should ban dolly ropes. The latest EU directives call for fishing net manufacturers to participate in cleanup operations as of July 2021. But there's no ban on dolly ropes on the horizon. Trash from the sea, including dolly ropes, also ends up here about 50 kilometers from the German mainland on the North Sea island of Heligoland. And it has devastating consequences for local bird life. 
The Guillemot Rock on the northwestern edge of Heligoland is a huge bird sanctuary. Every year from March to October, the steep sandstone walls are home to several bird species found nowhere else in Germany, especially kidawakes, guillemots, and gannets. Ornithologist Elmar Ballstedt has been caretaker of the protected area since 2018. About 10,000 pairs of birds breed here in a very confined space. They breed so close together for protection, safety in numbers. The gannet is the largest open sea bird in the northern hemisphere. It normally builds its nest from large algae floating on the sea or parts of other plants. It ends up confusing them with string and rope, which looks similar to algae. Then, of course, it builds them into the nest. Part of Elmar Ballstedt's work is to research how birds are dying. In particular, the young often get caught in the tear-proof fibers, leading to a cruel death. They end up growing up in a nest lined with plastic. If they get a foot or any other body part tangled in that plastic, they grow into it and can never free themselves again. They die as chicks without ever having flown. About 60 gannets die that way per year, and about 100 guillemots also get tangled and die that way. Right now, more than 90% of the gannets' nests are contaminated with plastic. It's easy to spot the many remnants of colorful dolly ropes. Only rarely can the trapped animals be freed. It's quite difficult to rescue the animals. The rock here is sandstone, it's very porous. So bits keep breaking off, and you just can't get near enough to the colony. We try to save individuals in nests close to the fence, but we simply can't reach the majority. The population is not endangered yet, but with the plastic waste increasing year by year, the colony's long-term survival is by no means certain. Elma Ballstedt wants to tackle the root cause. Simply clearing the nests of plastic is like tilting at windmills. Every year the gannets bring more plastic back, so you get nowhere. The aim has to be to reduce what's going into the sea. Less plastic waste in the ocean. That's what the divers from the Dolphin Rescue Organization are still working towards at the bottom of the Baltic Sea near Rügen. The trap anchor has now been completely freed from the net. The last buoyancy bag is attached. To be able to lift the nets, we need buoyancy bags of different sizes. We hook those into the nets, then we cut pieces off where they meet the wreck or the seabed and send them up. The buoyancy bags are filled with normal air from an oxygen cylinder. Their lift capacity ranges from 20 to 500 kilograms, depending on their size. So even heavy objects can be taken up to the surface. The organization is financed exclusively by donations and sponsorship. Operations like ghost net salvage are dependent on that money and are only possible because nearly everyone involved is a volunteer. Yeah. The material retrieved from the seabed is now being loaded onto the Goa. These nets are vorwiegend altlasten. These are predominantly older nets. In the past, fishing boats didn't have such good navigation systems. They would be trawling and they'd go over a wreck and get stuck. Today, 
They have very good maps. They know where the wrecks are, and they give them quite a wide berth. A modern trawler net can cost up to 100,000 euros. So fishing workers are careful not to lose anything if they can help it. Any lost nets must be reported. But that's a regulation that's often disregarded. There's this obligation to report, and it has to be complied with. That's what we're demanding. And if not, there should be penalties. The big problem here off the island of Rügen is gillnet fishing. Gillnets are inexpensive. So if one gets lost in a storm, they simply get a new one out of the storeroom. Gillnet fishing workers can report losses to us, and then of course we try to salvage the nets. There's even an advantage because anything that isn't broken can of course be used again. Wolfgang Frank and the Dolphin Rescue NGO are doing their best for the common good. Shouldn't the state also take action? Recovering ghost nets should be done by the government. It can't be left to small NGOs like us or WWF and Greenpeace. The state must step in. The Environment Ministry of the German state of Mecklenburg, Western Pomerania has since responded. It's providing 200,000 euros for a two-year pilot project to recover ghost nets in the Baltic Sea. It's hard to believe, but there are around 16,000 wrecks in the Baltic Sea, mostly merchant and military ships. About 1,400 are officially registered, around 300 off the coast of Rügen alone. That makes the area popular with divers, but it's also dangerous because ghost nets usually hang from the wrecks. Here we're diving down to the SAS-33 Sturmvogel, a wreck at a depth of 15 meters. In 1984, it collided with the Königslinie ferry, which was about 100 meters long. It sent the wooden cutter down to the bottom, and sadly, the engineer and captain went down with it and died. Experienced diving instructor Robert Roska leads the GRD operation. The big question is, will they be able to free the wreck of ghost nets and get them up to the surface? Ghost nets can also be found here, on the Jungfernstieg Promenade in Hamburg. This is the home of the Bracenet Company. Or to be more precise, small fragments of ghost nets are found here. The young company produces handmade key rings, dog leashes, and bracelets, all from nets salvaged from the sea. Benjamin Vinka came up with the idea six years ago. We were in Zanzibar on our yearly vacation. For the first time, we came across the extent of ghost nets. They were hanging on the beach, but also on the water. We decided we had to do something. Bracenet was founded in 2018. What began with two people sitting around the kitchen table has turned into a modest success story. The company now has 35 employees. And in the last two years, it sold around 40,000 of the bracelets it calls bracenets. These are just a few of the nets we need every day to make our products. They come from lots of different sources. A large part is salvaged by the 170 divers we partner with. We get many more from private individuals and from other conservation organizations like Sea Shepherd or WWF. For the most part, Brace nets are made of ghost net remains, though not exclusively. What's also happening more and more, and it makes us really happy to think that our preventative efforts are working, is that fishermen are knocking on the door and saying, I can't use this net anymore, and disposing of it would be too expensive for me. Those nets also end up with us. Brace net is not an NGO or charity. It's a company. Financing comes not from donations, but solely from the sale of its products. 
Up to five euros from each sale goes to help fund the recovery of ghost nets. So far, Bracenet has transformed around five tons of nets into new products. Today, some new raw material is arriving. It's come from a WWF ghost net salvage operation. Hey, Benjamin, I brought you some new nets. Great. We pulled them out of the Baltic Sea in Stralsund. You'll have to see what's there. It's a real mix of materials. They've already been hosed down a bit with water to get rid of the mud. We'll clean it again here and put it away. We'll probably make keychains again. We try to recycle everything. As valuable as the work of companies like Bracenet is, it's only a small contribution to the recycling of ghost nets. Recycling them on a larger scale is complicated. If they're really clean nets, then recycling is a bit easier. But there are different types of plastic in there, and some still have lead lines in them to make them sink. So they can't be recycled at all. You'd have to pick it all apart by hand, cut out the lead, and separate the different types of plastic. It's a huge undertaking. It only works on a small scale, like here at Bracenet. On a large scale, it's not economical, and it could only go towards thermal recycling. That is, incineration to create energy. In other words, there's still no way of recycling the huge number of ghost nets. But perhaps there are ecological alternatives to prevent them from existing in the first place. Politicians and the fishing industry know that long-lasting ghost nets are a problem, but it's hard to get back to the old natural materials because nets have to be robust to withstand the demands of commercial fishing. We need to research how to maintain their catching capacity, but design them so they won't damage nature so much. Initial research efforts are aimed at developing a material that will dissolve in seawater over time without leaving harmful residues. Things are still in their infancy. There are initial trials, but I know of nothing that's ready for the market. That makes a project now underway in Norway all the more important. Off the coast of Trondheim, three scientists are hoping their idea will help in the fight against ghost nets. A new type of tracking system called PingMe is designed to quickly locate lost fishing equipment. Tona Berg and her colleagues are about to conduct the first test deployment. The system consists of three parts. It's the transponder that we attach to the object, which goes below water. And then it's the system on board, that's the transmitter and the receiver. And then we have the cloud system, which is uh, communicating with the transceiver on board. For today's test, Tona Berg attached the Pingmi transponder to a typical Norwegian lobster basket. Whole chains of these baskets are usually sunk deep in the water on lines. Their location is marked with a buoy. If a piece of fishing gear is lost, software on board the vessel can precisely locate the transponder. We have a system that decodes the, the pygmy signal. We have a system that calculates the position, which is sent over to this charting system. Hmm. And uh, here we can see that the pygmy is lying here. It lies on a depth of 84 meters. Any vessel equipped with the software can receive PingMe signals, automatically helping to find lost equipment. The cloud-based solution also helps protect against theft. If a fisherman loses his gear, this will be reported to the cloud. If many boats have this system on board, not only the owner of the gear can find it, but also any other boat can find it because uh, it will pop up on their screen, and then the owner gets the message automatically from the cloud, telling the position and when it was located. The lost lobster baskets were quickly located and recovered, thanks to Pingmi. 
the system worked. The pilot test was successful. The research team now wants to increase the system's range. Soon, the invention could be saving a lot of time and money in the fishing industry, as well as the lives of vast amounts of marine life. Norway is a very big fishery nation, so we lose enormous. And on a worldwide basis, there is 640,000 tons lost every year of plastic coming from aquaculture and fishery industry. Our vision is that it should be used worldwide to um, minimize uh, lost fishing gear and uh, the ghost fishing problem worldwide. So new technology could bring fresh opportunities when it comes to recovering lost nets. The divers from the Dolphin Rescue Organization are still hard at work salvaging ghost nets in the Baltic Sea. They've reached the wreck of the sunken fishing boat. Thanks to its registered location, it was easy to find even in murky water. They've brought tried and trusted tools to help them, knives and buoyancy bags. A large plastic net is hoisted up to the Goa. It's also about making the problem visible. Ghost nets are often deep in the water, so people don't see them. It's important for us to get them out and stop them causing harm, but also to show people, to say, hey, there's so much trash in the oceans, we have to get it out, to increase awareness. The Goa docks back at the port in Zaznitz. The salvaged nets are loaded onto a trailer. This time, the team has retrieved almost four tons from the Baltic Sea. You can see this green material here. It's the kind of thing we absolutely have to get rid of. It's harmful to all animals and ultimately also to humans. At first, I just wanted to protect animals, but it's become so much bigger. It's the environment I live in. We all depend on the oceans and on nature. For me, that's the reason. That's what drives me. For the environmentalists, it was a successful operation. And even though clearing our oceans of plastic can seem like an uphill battle, they'll keep doing their part.